Okay. Oh, they just disappeared. Oh, there they are. Trilogy at Lake Norman. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone at Lake Norman. Can you wave? Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming. We certainly appreciate it. So I was just asking everybody here at Trilogy, wave to North Carolina. There you go. And I was just asking how many are gardeners. So how many of you, you're in a really small screen, but I can see you. How many of you are gardeners? Any hands go up? <laughs> Half of them. Okay, great. This is going to be really fun. We're going to be talking about growing herbs uh, gratefully. And it's about growing herbs. The annuals will talk to you about how to grow them and how to cut them and store them so you'll know all about it. So we'll go ahead and get started here. And if you have a question, um, especially if you're in Nor Lake Norman, um, shout it out or rate, you know, because I can't see if you raise your hands, but I will take all the questions at the end. So let's, I may answer uh, your question throughout the program. So we'll wait till the end for questions. Uh, unless it's really very, very impossible for you not to, you want to know right away, let me know and I will uh, go ahead. My name is Teresa Watkins. I'm a uh, landscape designer, garden author, and I uh, am a 23-year master gardener. And so I love digging in the dirt. Hi, Marie, come on in. And so uh, I just love digging in the dirt and helping people with their plants. So uh, usually I'm not this clean. And, uh, you know, I've got a lot of sweat, so we l I love gardening. So we're coming up on the Thanksgiving holidays. And uh, so that's a little bit of my background. Uh, I am the regional uh, reporter for Burpee. If you've ever bought seeds from Burpee, they're a great company. So I do the Southeast. You can go on to Burpee and mm -hmm. see uh, my advice there. And I'm a fellow with the University of Florida uh, for the environmental uh collaborative studies for natural resource challenges. So I'm very aware of the environment and I love to teach about uh, saving the environment. So here we go. Starting off with herbs, this is the oldest landscape design that's known to be in existence. This is in Switzerland and it's in a little abbey called uh, St. Gallen. And this plan you can definitely see where they had room for everything, and they had especially right there, right in the upper corner next to their kitchen area, they had their herb garden. Now, back then, they used them for cooking, but mainly for medicinal purposes. And so that's how we started using herbs was for medicinal purposes and to keep food uh, fresh. And so when they would uh, smoke food or dry it out, they would always use herbs with it too as well. So uh, this uh, landscape plan, I like to use it because it's very, for the 11th century, 1092, that's how old it is. So it is, uh, you know, a thousand years old, basically, uh, this plan. And so we've been designing landscapes a long time and herbs have always been a part of that. Here's the Renaissance gardens. Again, we started to, the Renaissance gardens, the herbs were used medicinally. The, uh, the church, they would have, they were the caretakers. It's where the first hospital started. And so herbs were used in that sense, but they also used them for cooking and adding to their meals. So that's basically a good history of the Renaissance gardens. Of course, whenever we traveled and traveled around the world, uh, they, they brought herbs back from other parts of the world. And so during the 16th and 17th century of exploration, we found a whole new uh, sources for herbs and uh, teas and all sorts of plants in our, uh, in our diet. So what is an herb? Okay, it's herb or herbaceous plants. And the definition is any plant with leaves, seeds, or flowers used for flavoring, food, medicine, or perfume. But it is also any seed-bearing plant which does not have a woody stem. Now we know what it is by woody because you can just break it in half, you know what a woody stem is. And it dies to the ground after flowering. So those of you from up north, you know the bulbs we have that go back down to the ground after they flower. And then some of the tropical plants after they flower, they um, considered an herb too. But bananas, did you know banana is an herb? 
Banana is an herb, and it has fruits, but they're also called berries. So the bananas are called berries, which is what they are. They have the seeds on the inside of the fruit. When you think about it, think about all the bananas we eat and those little, the little seeds we see in them. And so banana is also considered an herb. So here in Florida, we can grow bananas too very easily. In North Carolina, there are some that will take some snow uh, and still recover, but mainly uh, from about zone 8 to 11 or 12. So here we go. Here's all some various different ways of using herb gardens. They're defined not by the plants themselves too, but by their organization. So when you see the plants, the categories, then uh, you'll find different herbs in these categories, but sometimes the herbs will cover two, two to three different categories, like medicinal, which we have up there in the top, dyes and fibers. So it's also used in the industry trades for making clothes, the, the herbs were used for that. Spices, again, through Asia, through Africa, India, through uh, the uh, continent there, we uh, got spices. And then fragrances. A lot of the, uh, during the uh, 13th, 14th century, 15th century, during the plague, they would take the plants with the fragrances so that they would hide their body odor. 17th and 18th century, they would actually wear the herbs underneath their clothing and stick them in their clothes so they wouldn't smell. And so the herbs were used in that way. So fragrances are a very important part of uh, herbs. So what do we need for an herb garden? So herb gardens, it can be annual or perennial. Can anyone think of a perennial herb that we have that's very popular? Mint can be, can be perennial, uh, that's a good choice, but then also rosemary too. Rosemary can be an ornamental shrub, in fact. It can even be woody when we look at it that way. But uh, mints are a good choice. We're gonna talk a lot about mints as well. So we can grow them in all zones, but at certain times of the year, they're only available up north during the spring and summer, uh, the upper northwest coast, of spring and summer. But here in the south, North Carolina, uh, you know, Arizona, Oklahoma, Texas, we can grow them all year round, which is what I love to do. I love to keep them growing all year round in pots outside, mainly for me, So, because my house is kind of dark. So what do you need for an herb garden? You want to have dry or moist soils. Herbs, because of the, uh, of the type of plant they are, they're not woody, they're, they, they have a lot of moisture in their stems that they need uh, to be dry or moist. And when I say moist, if you have earthworms in your garden, you have moist soils, mesic soils is what it's called uh, scientifically, mesic soils. And that means the ground is not too dry, it's not too wet. Earthworms need moisture, but they can't swim. So they need to have soils that are organic, and those are the kind of soils that herbs do well in, dry or moist. Nothing close to a lake uh, or to an area where the gutter comes down all the time with the rainfall. Uh, here in Florida, we get uh, over 55 inches of rain a year, and so uh, we get a lot more rain. It's a little bit uh, harder to keep our plants not getting fungus. But in North Carolina, you know, anywhere where you have dry or moist soils, even clay soils is, is, is okay for herbs. So dry is your rosemary, your garlic, oregano, and thyme. Those are just some of the common ones. Your moist soils, the ones that like organic uh, soils, not too dry, not too uh, wet, are basil and chervil. And uh, those are great. So those are the moistures. What kind of sunlight? Full to uh, partial sunlight. Full sun is eight or more hours of sunlight a day. Okay, they love full sun, but you can grow herbs in partial sun as well, which means morning sun, afternoon shade, morning shade, afternoon sun, or on a patio, but they need at least five hours of sunlight a day for them to, to produce well. If not, you're, you're going to have them looking scraggly. They're not going to be as thick and full. And so you want them to have the best conditions. So full sun to partial sun is the best. There we go. What kind of design can you grow herbs in? Well, you can grow them in containers. 
that's fine. And they do very well in containers. You can have them close to your door, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But you can also grow them in a vegetable garden. You can grow them in your landscape borders. This is a beautiful um, border garden that uh, is in Buffalo, New York. Are you? They have the largest garden walk in the United States. Do you know about it? It's incredible. I just took a garden tour up there last year, and we took all Floridians up to Buffalo. It was an amazing trip. And so uh, garden beds, but they have the herbs growing right there in their front yard as part of their landscape design, and it works really well. It also works for butterfly gardens, herbs attract butterflies and uh, other pollinators. So butterfly gardens are a good choice for butterfly uh, or for herb gardens. You want to put the herbs somewhere where you're going to notice them and take advantage of them. If they're somewhere in the backyard or where you're not going by on a daily basis, you might forget about them and not use them. So put them where you can see them every day, and you can cut them. You can take a little bit. You can take a couple of leaves here and there, and you'll be able to get the best use of those herbs. This is a teacup of chamomile. This is at uh, Walt Disney World, uh, Disney World here, and in the English Cottage Garden, they have uh, their herbs planted in teacups, large teacups, and so it just is really cute. But again, any container you want, you can put all of the same uh, different types of herbs in one pot. So that's um, that, that can be done, or just your favorites in a teacup. Again, put them where you can see them. Here are some designs and uses of gardens. I love the checkerboard one, which is right outside the front door. Very easy. They look like they're in all of their own containers, but that's just in the ground, and they have the pavers in a checkerboard style. And so that looks very cute in the front yard. But then they also have one that's in the fountain. And so many times I see in homes now where we're not running the water and wasting water in fountains anymore. So people are starting to plant them. And herbs will grow very well in there, in that little circular garden. Or you can hang them on the wall. And as long as they get full sun, this is a chain box. And the, the boxes of herbs are just hanging on the wall. You could do this outside your patio area and hang the chains up. And that looks really cute. And you can see that they have the different herbs. There's a couple of boxes that have a mixture of herbs in them. And then there's some that have different herbs. So whatever your fancy is, that's, it's, it's okay to mix them. Here's a lovely chef's garden. I have two sons that are chefs, and they love to have, they have all of the, their herbs in pots outside the back door. And so nobody's allowed to smoke, but they go out there and they cut the herbs, and uh, they, they bring them in and use them in all their recipes. So you, again, to get the best advantage of having herbs, put them somewhere where you're going to take you notice them and can bring them inside, okay, so that you uh, take the best advantage. The mint family. So how do you know if the mint family, if the, the herbs you're getting are in the mint family? This is something that we have native mint here in uh, North America. And so you can tell very easily. Now, when you go to the store and any kind of garden center you have, I want you to feel the stem, the shape. All mints have square stems, four-sided. So when you're feeling the, 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 the stem of the plant, you're going to notice how many of our, bless you, how many of our annuals and perennials have square stems and how many of them are in uh, the mint family. So you can tell that they're in the mint family by the square stems, they have smaller leaves, so that the leaves are opposite, usually two, sometimes four, four leaves as they're going up to the top, and they get smaller as they go to the top before they flower. That way you know they're in the mint family. And then uh, they have tubular flowers. Now, who likes tubular flowers? Hummingbirds and butterflies, okay? They have those long tongues and, uh, and the proboscis of the, of the butterflies, and they need tubular flowers to, to take the nectar from. So mint family has a lot of uh, butterfly-attracting plants in it. So there's a picture of the coleuses. How many of you are familiar with coleuses and grow coleuses? 
It's, well, it is. I don't think it tastes good, okay, but it's not toxic, if that's what you're asking, okay? But you could use it as a garnish. Wouldn't that be beautiful as a garnish? But again, I wouldn't eat it, but, you know, you can't. It's, it's in the mint family, so it's definitely not toxic. How about say that? So there's over 250 uh, genera's of mints, and they have over 8,000 species of mints in, around the world. Okay, so here's some of the mint family. Ajugas. How many of you grow ajugas? Anybody? Ajugas are wonderful. They do grow here. They're a beautiful plant. They're very popular up north. There are some, uh, as you get to North Carolina, they're very popular. I grow them here. Okay, ajuga, anise hyssop, basil is in the mint family. All right, bells of Ireland. How many of you have ever grown bells of Ireland? They are a biennial. I don't know if anyone's raising their hand in North Carolina, but by, um, bells of Ireland are a biennial, which means they, they're, they're grown, they propagated, emerged the first year, and then they don't bloom until the second year, okay? Uh, bee balm, how many of you are familiar with bee balm up north? Bee balm is in the mint family. Catnip, all right? Uh, Coleus's lamb's ears is in the mint family. Uh, lemon balm, lamia. This is a lamium right up here in the, the picture. The purple flower is a lamium. Lavender is in the mint family. Did you know that? I think that's interesting. Marjoram, oregano is in the mint family. Uh, I got marjoram up there twice. Uh, so it's just really important that you know that marjoram is in the mint family. Uh, rosemary is in the mint family. Then also sage and salvia. How many of you have ever noticed that salvia looks very much like a uh, herb, uh, looks like the sage? Feel it. It's got a square stem. Okay. Also savory and thyme. But then there's also some woody plants that are in the mint, uh, mint family. Teak, the teak tree is in the mint family. And then also vitex. Is there anybody that's familiar with chase trees? There's a couple of chase trees in the community that I've planted. I know myself. They're beautiful, aren't they, Marie? They're wonderful. And they smell so good. And so that's the Vitex. So those are also in the mint families. So saying that all these plants are in the mint families, let's talk about just mint that you can grow in your garden. So let's see. I'm just going to do this real quick so we can just talk about each one of them. And you can look at them. So there is a banana mint which means it's a mint plant that smells like banana, a Moroccan mint, Egyptian mint, peppermint, and then there's a variegated peppermint, uh, orange bergamot peppermint, or mint, lavender mint, curly spearmint, which is different than regular spearmint, kind of like the parsley and the curly parsley, uh, macho mint, I have to find this and grow it. I don't know what it is, but I just, the name of it, macho mint. Now, that could be a bad thing. I don't know. It could be really aggressive, but I have to find, yeah, <laughs> yeah, macho. <laughs> and then there's a the mojito mint. I think that's going to be my favorite. And then there's also the Corsican, the Havoc chocolate mint. Has anybody here ever grown chocolate mint? <gasps> It smells just like a Girl Scout cookie. I am telling you, oh my goodness. Doesn't it smell like a Girl Scout cookie? You smell the chocolate and it's great to use on ice cream in your teas for desserts. It's wonderful. Then there's the pineapple mint, penny royal mint, and then there's a the lemon bergamot apple mint, which does have the apple smell. It's really quite nice. Uh, the Kentucky kernel mint. Now, I don't know if this means it tastes like chicken, or if, it's, if it smells like chicken, I don't know, but it's called Kentucky Kernel Mint and then Wintergreen. Now, some of these mints you can find on Burpee uh, if you want to grow the seeds for them. So they're really cool to find, so you can do that. Mints grow to be about two feet in height. They make a really good ground cover or an area for mass plantings. They are perennial in zones 5 through 11. Okay, so that five takes us above Massachusetts there, so uh, it's up to the Canadian border. So you can grow those all year round. The color of mint flowers are white, and uh, they are used as a butterfly plant, culinary, or fragrancy, and then also medicinal. 
So those are good plants. Now here in Florida, they do make a great ground cover if you'd like to use them as one. There you go. So here is sage, and I'm just going to put down the different varieties. Let's see, one more. There we go. All right, so common sage, which is our typical sage. I love using sage. I also like using the variegated one, the one that is purple. It's really quite nice. Pineapple sage, a white sage, Cleveland sage. I don't know what that is. I have to find that one to find out what it is. Cherry sage, and then there's a grape scented sage. So the one down in the bottom right-hand corner is the tri-colored sage. That is my favorite. I love it as a filler in containers so that it's not the main plant, but it just fills in nicely, and it's very good. I love using it in bread, too, as well. So one thing about uh, sage is, though, it is prone to aphids and mites. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you're keeping it cut all the time, but there is not too many and I'll talk a, a lot about pest problems in, in just in a few later slides, but there's not too many uh, revenue, uh, avenues for you to spray chemicals on your herbs, and you really don't want to. So by using them often, you're going to kind of bypass that, that issue. Oregano, there's so many types of oregano. It uh, means mountain brightness is what the word comes from. It's uh, Latin, oregano. And it means mountain uh, brightness. But here, let me just put these down. There we go. So there's Italian oregano and Mexican oregano. And they do have different tastes. So you definitely, they have different leaf structures. Greek oregano, which is very thick. Greek and oregano, I mean, Greek and Cuban oregano are um, very thick leafed. And you can really get some good oils out of them. They're nice to use for oils if you like some uh, flavored oils. They're, they're really quite strong. Now, how many of you have heard of verbena? Okay, so the Cuban oregano is in the verbena family, which is in the mint family. So uh, vervain family. So that's uh, really um, quite nice to know that. But they are, the one on the bottom right-hand corner is the uh, Cuban. So you can see the different thickness of it. It looks quite dense. Let's see. They like uh, full sun and dry soil. Okay, oregano is, I've got a, a pot of oregano that sits on my patio. It gets full sun till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I water it maybe once a month. That's all. So it's, it gets rainfall when we have rainfall, but I never, it just, when we're dry, I'll just water it about once a month. So oregano likes dry soil. So I think that's where we get a lot of our issues in taking care of plants, is that we're too kind to them and we water them too much. So you want to make sure that a good way to test if you need to water is to stick your finger in the soil up to your second knuckle. If the ground is cool, moist, or damp, you don't need to do anything to it. They don't like to be overwatered, all right? And so if you are thinking you've got problems, most of the time it's from overwatering that we see plants die. We're being too kind to them. They don't like it. Now, the symptoms for needing water, we think of as what? Wilting? Have we ever seen that the plants wilt? Well, the symptoms for underwatering and overwatering are the same. So if your plant's wilting, it could be because it's too dry and the roots get desiccated, very dry, and it can't absorb water. Or it could be it's so wet, the roots are rotting and they're bloated and they can't absorb water. So just because a plant wilts doesn't necessarily mean that you need to water it. You need to find out if it's being watered too much. And that could be the same symptom. There we go. Here's some thyme. And thyme is wonderful. It smells so good. There's even a creeping thyme that you can put between a pathway that you can walk on that you can smell the fragrance. I love that. And when our dogs would go out to the yard and they would walk out through the creeping thyme, they smelled so much better when they came in that uh, they, do, they do really well. But French lemon and caraway just depends on the recipes you're using, which one you'd like to use. Because the lemon and caraway will go together well nicely in an oil. Uh, the French and lemon will do nicely. I don't know if I'd use all three of them together in the same uh, oil. But I do have uh, handouts. Uh, Allison, you sent it to their, uh, their, their uh, 
Yeah, okay, so they've got it. So you have the handouts. Yay, I'm so glad. Those are recipes. Now I have another handout that I couldn't copy in time, but at the end of the program, I'm going to have my email address for you at Lake Norman. And if you will email me, I will send you another uh, herb handout. Herb handout. There you go. And uh, and uh, it's a really great one. So email me and I will send it to you. It'll be a little bit easier than trying to print it out for everyone. No, but I can send you a, a handout, a black and white handout of this program. Okay, so if you'd like the handout of this program too as well, uh, just uh, send me an email and I will send it to you. Okay, wonderful. So there are two types of uh, time. There's the ornamental and the culinary, and it has so many different types. Again, there's, again, over 8,000 species in the mint family. So let's talk a little bit about pest issues. Okay, so I don't want you to have to use uh, chemicals, and it's not necessary for your edible plants. We like to use what's called integrated pest management. It's where you, um, you, you have a little bit of tolerance for some insects. Okay, what, what's your tolerance level? Do you not want to handle a few? Because when you have beneficial bugs in your garden, they need a few pests so that they have a food source and they will stay in your garden. If there is no uh, uh, no bad bugs in your yard, then you're not going to get a lot of beneficials that are going to come in and eat. But also, too, um, if you use, again, like I said earlier, if you're using your herbs often, there's not going to be that many uh, pest issues. Harvest them often. Okay, so how do you avoid pest issues? You have good practices for your gardening. I don't want you to water at night especially here in Florida. Now the humidity in North Carolina is really bad in the summertime, not necessarily in the wintertime, but when you have humidity and rain or water, if you're irrigating, and you have the pathogen, that's where you're gonna get fungal issues. So never water at night. You wanna water so that your plants dry off within five hours. So watering at six, seven o'clock in the morning, if they're being irrigated, then they're going to be dry by, by noontime, and that's okay. But if you're watering in the afternoon at 4 and 5 o'clock or at 1 o'clock in the morning, they're going to stay wet for longer than five hours, and that's where you're going to see your pest problems. So make sure you are not watering at night. Anytime after 5 o'clock in the morning is a good time to water, especially here in Florida where we have humidity all year round. Uh, make sure you, again, don't overwater just because it's wilting. Stick your finger in the pot, okay? So how can we pick an herbs? What do we do? Pick them in the morning before the full sun because that's when the oils are concentrated in the leaves. After the heat of the day, they start to disperse, and the fragrances, you'll smell them more, but the oils aren't going to be in the, in the leaves as much. So you want to pick them in the morning. And when I say pick them, you don't want to use um, uh, a lot of heavy equipment. Picking them is just fine or using scissors. You want to wash with cold water before using. So if you're not going to use them that same day, don't, water, don't wash them. Just put them in a baggie in your, in your refrigerator, a cheesecloth in your refrigerator, and then right before you're using them, then you clean them, watering them. Kind of like mushrooms. You don't clean those until you're actually going to cook with them. All right, and then you want to cut with scissors. Cutting with scissors is going to keep the oils concentrated in, in there and not in your fingers. You know, you're not going to tear them. So it'll keep them right in, uh, in, the, in the leaf cuttings. If you would like to dry your herbs, which is very easy to do, you can tie them in bundles and hang them. You can lay them flat on a rack, and that rack is got, um, it's a metal mesh. Okay, so you could put that, and I would actually put a cheesecloth underneath it so that it's not going on the metal, uh, and then put cheesecloth over it, too. If you're hanging them outside, put cheesecloth over it. It'll keep the dust and the insects off of them. And then you can also place them flat on a baking rack or one of the cooling racks that you use for cookies. You can do that as well. So again, when you're drying herbs, you want to um, have the herbs in a single layer across a cookie sheet. And the, the best setting is 150 degrees, 
but some ovens don't go down that low. So they only go down to like 170. So if it doesn't go below 170, then what you want to do is, you know how you can turn it on and it starts to warm up? And as soon as it gets to 150, shut it off. And then check your, check your herbs and then turn it on again to one, till it reaches 150 and then turn it off. All right? And so you can do that every five minutes or so. It'll only take about five minutes for it to heat up like that. Um, so pick them on the warm, dry mornings. Don't use discarded le or damaged leaves. So if there's any that's been eaten on, you don't want to use those, okay? Any that have fungus issues on them, little spots on them, you don't want to use those either. Tie them in small bunches, and you can leave the woody stems on them and just take the leaves off of the portion that you're wrapping around. You can wrap them in muslin or paper bags. That'll work. And then just check them to see how long. Different times of the year, it may take five days. During the summertime, it may only take two to three days. So check that. Um, and then, again, oven dry at the lowest settings. You can microwave them dry, but you want to put them between paper towels and then just really fast, one minute, less than one minute, and keep checking them until they've dried out, okay, depending on your um, – right. I would wait until they dried again and then dry them. So if you're going to wash them before using them, I would in the same day, then I would just uh, paper towel dry them. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. You're saying if you wash them before, I would dry, I would make sure that they're really not very damp because you don't want that moisture in the microwave oven. You can do it for the oven portion. If you're using it in a regular oven, you don't. You can wash them and uh, damp dry them and then put them in the oven. If you're going to microwave them, I would want to make sure that they're a little bit drier. Well, the moisture, the moisture, the microwave oven puts moisture back in to to what it's cooking. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're go okay, so she asked if you're going to hang them, what should you do? Go ahead and wash them, and then t tile dry them, pat, pat them dry, and then hang them up. Okay, they'll be fine. You are. You're, you're going to do it. You are going to do it, Rose. You're going to do it. <laughs> Everybody has to encourage Rose that she can do it. Okay. So here's a lavender drying rack. Isn't that pretty? Can you imagine the smell? Oh, that would be wonderful. Okay. So you can do all of your herbs. It doesn't need to be all lavender, but you can see one. You can get, go to the Salvation Army or to uh, Goodwill. You find these sometimes, you know, available. Sometimes you will see them by the side of the road. Pick them up and then just put it on your patio, and that's, that'll be a good place for you to uh, rack dry them. Again, if you're having these outside and you're drying them outside, put a cheesecloth over them so that dust doesn't get on them or insects get, get on them. So another way to uh, get your herbs is by freezing them. Okay, and so this might be an option for you, Rose, if you're going to wash them. Yeah, exactly. So you just place the chopped herbs and leaves in a nice tray and fill it to, with the water. And then you, once it freezes, you just pop them out and put them in a, in a plastic baggie uh, or uh, any kind of container you have if you're using some of the Tupperware containers and place the herbs in a uh, freezer bag, and they're good to go. What I like about this is that I can just take one out for my gravies that I make or if I'm making a soup or even just, you know, using them to um, – oh, what is it when you put it in and you scrape the, uh, the, the meat cuttings? What's that called? What is that called? Yes, deglazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deglazing. I like to use it with deglazing. Uh, if, I, if I don't have wine or something else to use, I can use the, uh, the ice cubes, and it'll do quite nicely. So freezing, again, you want to see how you uh, just take the leaf off, lay it flat. You can put it on a cookie tray, put it in the uh, freezer, and freeze it for about 20, 30 minutes, it will do. And then take it out, and you can cut it up and put it into bags, put it into ice trays. So it's a really easy way to do it. Or if you like the basil, if you just want to use basil for uh, any kind of bruschetta and you want the whole leaf, then just take the whole leaf and freeze the whole leaf, and then you can take it out again. Okay. 
Storing herbs, you want to place stems of fresh herbs in a glass of water, you can store that in the refrigerator so that if you're not going to use it today, you can cut it today because if not, the insects, you know, might get it, but you can cut it and then use it within a couple of days and that's fine. If you're storing them dried after you dry them, then you definitely want to put them in a cool, dry, dark place. That's not your refrigerator. Okay, put it in a, in a closet somewhere where it's going to stay nice and cool. And you want to make sure that the containers are airtight. You can use them up to six months. Six months you can keep them in an air a dried container. So that's good. Um, the publication that I, that I sent to you has all sorts of great recipes, but come up with your own. When I send you the other handout, it will give you combinations and what they're good for. Make up your own recipe. Get some cream cheese and add, add the herbs to it. You could do that. In a bread, just put all the herbs that you like into a bread, and it will be your own, uh, own recipe. So uh, very easy to do. So when you're using dried versus fresh, so in your recipes, dried herbs, if you're using dried herbs, are two to three times stronger than fresh. So what that means is that you're going to have to use more fresh herbs for your recipe. But here's the caveat. Don't double your recipe. Okay, so that's what we would think of when we're saying, okay, instead of I'm cooking for four, I'm going to be cooking for eight, so I'm going to double the recipe. Not with herbs because it may be too potent, too strong if you double the recipe. So always start out with one, one and a half times the amount of herbs and see if that fits your taste. If it doesn't, you can always add more. But if it's too strong, then you can't take it back out again. Okay, so you'll come up with how strong you want it. But always start off with one and a half times the amount and then add more as needed. So general guideline is that when you're using fresh herbs, use three times as much of the, uh, dr uh, three times as much as a dried herb, which is what I just said. So w instead of one teaspoon or tablespoon, you wanna use three teaspoons, three tablespoons. But again, taste it. If you're doubling a recipe, only start off with one and a half times and see how much is what you would prefer. There are some great ways to use herbs, even if you don't eat them. So let's say your rosemary is getting really too big and it's getting really woody. Well, then why not make a wreath out of it? Put it by your front door. You could create a dried arrangement, but you could uh, use it as a garnish or you could make your own potpourri. And that's really fun to do, making your own potpourri from your own herbs. You can make uh, bath soaks. So putting the rosemary or even the thyme, the oregano, the mint into your baths, you can do that. You can make bath soaks. Candies, you can make herbs out of the candies, the mint, the spearmint, and the peppermint. You can make candies out of. Laundry dryer sachets. So just your favorite fragrances and just put them in cheesecloth and tie it with a little ribbon and then put it into uh, the dryer. And your, especially your linen, and it will take and that will be really nice. Or just lavender, if you're growing lavender, and you want to, you know, just put it in with your your uh, uh, actual uh, sheets that you're doing that laundry that day. Then just go ahead and add the um, the sachet of rosemary. Smudging, smudging is very popular with sage. Does anyone um, is familiar with smudging? Whenever you go to a new home or something, you want to just clean the air, clean the, the, the room of any kind of bad feelings or bad uh, sensations. It's called smudging. And as you can see, it's in the upper uh, right-hand corner. You just make a kind of uh, stalk with a number of woody stems, some leaves on it, but not a lot of leaves. You don't want to burn the house down. And then you go ahead and tie wrap it, and then you just burn the ends of it and you go around and you go to all four corners and you smudge the area. Uh, my mom used to do that. So uh, my brother does that. Uh, you can use them as room scents. So after you cut them, you can put them in a little potpourri and just a little uh, container, a bowl, and just have that fragrance, especially Mediterraneans. If you do the oregano and the uh, basil and uh, thyme, and rosemary all in the area. It'll always smell like something that's baking in the kitchen, which is really nice.
You can use all of your cuttings that you cut off. Let's say you're not using the woody stems. You can create your own fire starters. How nice would that be for your fireplace? That will be lots of, that will smell really good. And you can use them as fire starters, or you can create your own wreath. Now, one of the herbs that I like to grow, which is actually a woody, is the bay, the bay uh, tree. They do grow well here. They grow well in North Carolina. And I like to, to cut my bay leaves off and use it for my stews and soups. And it's about this tall right now, but eventually it will get to be 10 to 12 feet tall. And you can just cut them uh, as, as, as you need them. There's also another woody uh, tree that grows well here in Florida. I don't know. I'll have to check when you, if you're interested in getting one, let me know and I'll find out if it's good in North Carolina. But there is a tree called an allspice tree. And it smells just like allspice. And I always cut the leaves off to put on my Christmas table. Do you have one? It grows in Jamaica. It's a wonderful tree. Oh, it's wonderful. It's a nice tree. And uh, so Marie was saying that it's from Jamaica, the Caribbean, and it will grow nicely there. So I don't know whether it'll grow there in, outside in North Carolina, but you can grow it in a pot and then use it that way. And, so, and just take it in for the winter time if you're getting snow and things like that. But this allspice tree has the red berries on it that make the actual allspice. And it is amazing. I have one in my backyard. It is 15 feet tall. And I love using the, the leaves on it every day. So you can make a wreath out of that. So think about getting an allspice tree if you would like to. So let's see. So this, this is a, yeah, a labyrinth of lavender. And so I'm not suggesting any of you should try to build one, okay? But it's just, it's just really pretty, but it just shows you how they, they used it in this yard. Use your herbs, okay? So put them somewhere where you can get them on a daily basis if you need to, especially if you're cooking meats and poultry and, and uh, fish, then you can use them using dill, having dill right by your, um, uh, your front door so that you can cut it and bring it inside for any kind of meals that you're cooking. Always look at them before you cut them, though. I remember one year... I was having Thanksgiving, and I went and got parsley out of the garden. I brought it in, just washed it off real quick. And so it was on everybody's plate for Thanksgiving. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this little caterpillar, and it was crawling across the table. So I all of a sudden raised my eyebrows real big, and I started doing this with my hands and just talking and being very animated until it got underneath the plate of somebody else. It went whew. So always check, even if you watch them, there still might be a little critter on there. So always inspect your herbs. Use them, though. You want to harvest leafy herbs, and a leafy herb would be the basil, would be uh, the mints, the sages, all of those. You want to harvest those when they're young. So you don't want to use the older ones if they start to get woody. And sage will start to get woody real quick, especially if you don't use it. So cut it often, but you want to harvest the leafy herbs when they're young, you want to harvest the bulbous herbs when they're mature. So that would be like your onions, your chives, your leeks, anything like that. So you have to wait until they get mature enough. But I will tell you, I had chives self-seed in my garden bed. And so I had regular chives, and it's just wonderful to go over there and weed. I get so hungry weeding when there's chives in the garden. And so, um, but I, what I do is I go out when I need chives or a baked potato or something like that. I just go cut the top of the, of the chives, and it just stays in the ground, and it just keeps continuing to grow. So, but you want to harvest the herbs when they are mature and that would be like garlic too is another one but you can always eat the greens of the garlic you can eat the greens of the chives and uh, greens of onions i always uh scallions and leeks you can always use the greens of those and cut them anytime here's one thing too is that if you want to get grow garlic just go to the store buy a clove separate the cloves and put the cloves in the ground and they will grow a whole new garlic bulb each one of those. If you're cutting onions, if you will take the ends of the onions, the ones where the roots, you can see the roots of them, 
just slice that off at the bottom, stick it in a pot, and it will start to grow another onion. Okay, so you could do that. You can do the same with some of the leafy uh, herbs too as well. Um, you, want, you can use the flowers. So if you want to use decorations, if you're making a cake or you're having a dessert and you have these herbs in your garden, borage, basil, if they go to flower, then you can actually eat those flowers. All right, uh, chives, dill, ginger. We grow a lot of ginger down here in Florida. So the gingers that you see in the, in the gardens, the, the variegated gingers, you could eat those flowers too as well. Um, lavender, you can eat the flowers of lavender, marjoram, mint, oregano, rosemary, and thyme. Those flowers, if they go to flower, you could eat them. Try not to let them go to flower, though, if you're wanting to use the leaves. Because once they go to flower, they bolt is the phrase for it. Then the leaves start to get a little bit um, bitter tasting, and they don't have the same flavor. But all you got to do is cut the flowers off and let it start to grow again. Don't plant next to toxic plants. By this I mean, when I was first starting out as a garden uh, designer, landscape designer consultant, I was walking through a client's yard, and they had a beautiful vegetable garden, and they had beautiful bulbs, and I saw the onions, and I saw the chives, and I bent down, and I picked a leaf, and I popped it in my mouth. Well, I was young and eager, and so I'm walking around, but the minute... I put it in my mouth and swallowed it. I knew I had done something wrong. My mouth started to foam up, and I am thinking to myself, oh, my God, I've eaten something toxic. So I'm doing my la da and I'm going, so, Joanne, what is this plant? And she goes, oh, those are the daffodils that are coming up. And daffodils are poisonous. So here, the headlines in the newspaper, garden expert dies in client's yard after eating poisonous daffodils. I could just see it. I just knew my reputation was ruined. I was going to die in this yard right there in front of my client. So I got to the car. I just made some excuses and, and got to the car. I left real quick. And I called my secretary and I said, Anna, if I die before I get to the hospital, I've just eaten daffodils. Don't tell anybody. And so instead of going to the hospital, I went to the 7-Eleven and I got a Coke and I was fine. But it just made the point that, one, you don't taste anything in a yard unless you know what it is, even if it looks like something you enjoy. And two, don't plant your herbs next to toxic bulbs, okay? So make sure of that because the, the chives and everything, the daffodils look like chives coming up. So make sure you don't plant them in the same area. So if you want to have this um, handout, I will give you these resources. These are great articles. One of the articles you have already is how to grow with the uh, herbs. But there's also some good books by Doug Green. He's a great friend of mine. He has a wonderful book, The 20, uh, the Best 20 Herbs for Tea and Health. And then also Burpee. You can go on to burpee.com and get uh, the seeds. If you can't find them in the store, getting seeds is a really good choice. And then you can also go onto my Pinterest board, and I'll show you that right here. If you'd like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook, uh, then also on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. But I have to show you, I have over 100 boards on Pinterest on every type of gardening you would like. And so if you go into Pinterest, you can follow me there and you can see lots of different great plant ideas, landscape designs for different themes. And that is a wonderful, I, I, I enjoy going there and, and playing on Pinterest. Is anybody else on Pinterest in, in, in Lake Norman? Anybody? Yes. It's addicting, isn't it? It's so addictive if you get on there. You gotta, I got to get off and, and do that. I also have a monthly newsletter, which will work in North Carolina, too, as well. It's for the South. It is a free monthly gardening newsletter. It tells you what to do in your yards. And uh, it has landscape design ideas, how to deal with landscapers, and some great plant ideas, too, as well. So if you'd like to uh, connect with me there, you can just go to my website, which I will show you. And it's, go to just Google me, right, Allison? making sure Allison's paying attention there. <laughs> and so uh, you can just Google me, Teresa Watkins, in your backyard, and you can find my website right there. Also, too, I do garden tours. We went to Buffalo last year. It was an amazing trip. 
And this year we are going to the Brandywine area, which is a lot of fun. We're going to go to the three biggest botanical gardens, the most loveliest botanical gardens. So if you'd like more information on that, you can uh, give me uh, an email and, and ask for more information on that. We have a great time. We're all a bunch of gardeners that go, so we geek out just at plants and it's just a lot of fun. We have a great time. I have two books out, and my third one's coming out soon. If you love poetry, if you love anything about gardening, trivia, history, uh, the, you will enjoy these books. They're reading books. They're not how-to garden books. They're more for just reading, putting by your bedside, giving as gifts. And if you uh, run your own newsletter or blog, uh, you you will find all the correct information in there of sources. So this book, I just knew that watching on internet, you see so many things that are mis misquoted. Uh, they have Marilyn Monroe said this, that so and so said Shakespeare said that, and they didn't. Buddha never said anything. Okay, so just when you see when you see memes on there, it was written in the 1960s by a Buddhist temple in California. And so that's where all these sayings come from. And so uh, on the back of the book, I, I say that Abraham Lincoln says you can't believe everything you read on the Internet. And uh, but in in my books, I have the original sources and sites and the actual quotes of poetry. And so you can use them. And it's a lot of great fun. I, I love to read the books. So the first one is called The Gardener's Compendium. Gardening in a Twitter world in 140 characters or more, because who can say anything in 140 characters? I can't. And so the first one is on uh, life. It's about birth and death and gardening in, in all those aspects and spirituality and uh, families, children. The second one is on gardening in time and place. And it's about history and geography and gardening in all those different areas. And uh, some things will be very amazing. Uh, there's, it also deals a little with politics and, and governments. And then the third one is gardening with the senses. And that's coming out as soon as I can keep – I'm writing so hard, I'm getting carpal tunnel syndrome. And so, bless you. And so it's gardening with the senses, sight, taste, sound, hearing, and then uh, what's the other touch, and then also common sense. So it has gardening with all those aspects on it. I am also a member of the Great Garden Speakers. I just love talking to garden clubs and talking to groups. I just uh, presented at a national conference in Utah, uh, and Utah is just a gorgeous place. I didn't realize how beautiful Utah was in August. So if you would like to go on to greatgardenspeakers.com and review my program, I would certainly appreciate that. That will be helpful. So if you have any questions, I can answer any questions. Let me take Lake Norman first. Do you have questions, Lake Norman? Well, very good. Lisa, oh, I, Teresa. Yes. What do yes. you think of arrow gardening? Arrow gardens uh, in the wintertime. Do you use arrow gardens for growing herbs? Arrow gardens to water? Arrow? Arrow. A E R O. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. That's fine. So it wicks the water up. Okay. So, so it's kind of like hydroponic. Right. Yes. Okay. Hydropo that's fine too. And they grow very well on that. And I, um, they have the tower um, kind of gardens too as well. The, that's fine. It's just that you get, just want to make sure that you are giving them the right amount of water, that it's not wicking it up too much. So yeah, that they're fine as long as you're right on top of it. Okay. Does it, does that answer it? I like them because you can use them in small spaces, you know, so if you have them, or if you go away a lot, there are several um, containers that have the water where it wicks up. Earth boxes is one of them that you don't have to water like once a month, but you can go away for two to three weeks and you know that they'll be watered fine. So, yeah, they're, they're okay. They're good. Any other questions? Do I have any questions here? Yes, sir. Oh my goodness. So you, oh, you brought it. Oh, okay. He brought a plant for an ID. So, okay. Yes, that is a calancho. Calancho. K A L A N C O E. You can also call it calanchoe. It is part of that family. 
It's not edible. <laughs> it just grows just like that. It has a beautiful flower. Yes, it does. You got it in the in the in the kitchen. I um, mean, you got it at a grocery store. Oh, so they they gave him a plant. Well, that's good. I'll babysit your plants, and that'll be fine if somebody can give me more plants. No, it it it's, it's it grows. It's a succulent, so you don't need to water it much. It, I would treat it just like a cactus. Full sun, water once a month, and it'll be just fine. And fertilize on it, you know, every couple of months. Okay, good for you. That's a, that's great. Any other questions on growing herbs? Do I have extra handouts? Yes, I do, right up here. Okay, so I have plenty for everyone here. If you would like to, okay, so now I've got to do my, okay, so you got to answer this. Why did the Swedish chef have to stop cooking the turkey? Anybody know? Because he ran out of time. <laughs> there you go. So here's my website right here. If you would like to connect with me about the, the garden tours or for the handouts, please connect with me on here and send me an email. I would love to hear from you. And uh, go on Great Garden Speakers, if you will, and review me. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you.